afternoon, I'm Dave Jenkins from Heriwatt University. I'm the theme champion for energy efficiency in buildings. I'm joined by Daniel Fossas from the University of Edinburgh, who's the deputy theme champion uh, for, this, for this theme. So we've got four presentations today. We are going to give you the full 10 minutes. Uh, you'll get a bit of a warning at nine minutes to, to hurry up. If you go up above 10 minutes, then you're eating into your question time. And then if you hit 15 minutes, then we're just going to drag you off the stage and turn your microphone off. So that's, that's how it's going to be uh, set up. OK, so first of, all, first of all, can I invite Olu Falaki Olu Mugba from the Glasgow School of Arts up to the stage? Thank you. And this presentation is going to be on the relationship between user satisfaction and carbon footprints in buildings. So 10 minutes, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, to start with my, um, with my first slide um, and I think I should well that's what you need to know uh, my second slide really basically I'm, I'm asking why why have I chosen the topic um, the topic is the relationship between user satisfaction um, density and carbon food in the mega city of Lagos um, so it's it, the topic is, is around uh, climate change, um, but why why did I ch select this topic? Basically, um, in in Lagos we have a, a housing deficit of about five million, and um, so it's a mega city as well. We've got poor infrastructure, rapid growth uh, in the city, and um, one of the main reasons why I chose this topic. Uh, it's about working towards the, the, the future and it's to, to try and establish a mathematical coefficient to determine appropriate outcomes by testing and implementing these different variables. Uh, and basically, um, in establishing variables for carbon footprint, um, I looked at embodied carbon primarily because a lot of the building materials in, in, in that part of the world is imported. So it's difficult to uh, establish a life cycle um, assessment for, for the actual materials. And um, electricity supply, energy supply, is very epileptic. I mean, you get about an hour to five hours of uh, generated power a day. So it's difficult to ascertain that um, component uh, um, in, in that part, well, in, in Lagos. However, um, that part of the world uh, doesn't really emit so much carbon like the other parts of the world do. Um, so in looking at projects of that part of the world, you're looking at carbon offsetting primarily and also trying to determine how to work around establishing um, this coefficient for uh, um, carbon footprint uh, in embodied uh, carbon. So the story basically is housing emissions are 31% for buildings. Uh, embodied carbon is 10% of it. Uh, so we're looking at um, how do we create better housing based on information from the users um, to actualizing green housing. Um, um, this is just a background about Lagos. It's got a population of about 4.2 mi three million um, and within the Lagos environment, we're looking at about 30, sorry, 20 million. 70% um, of Lagos dwellers live in slums, um, and we have a 5 million housing deficit. And Lagos was described by Rem Koolhaas as being a paradigmatic, self regulating, dysfunction, disconnected city with an informal economy, which it is. I mean, you go there. Um, it's a season four foot of the rise. You go there and you think, gosh, how does this work? But it works. And it's just, you know, quite um, interesting when you get into the fabric of, of the city. 40% of people live uh, less than a um, dollar a day. So there's a lot of challenges with um, actually actualizing things and what they do. So the, the, the way forward really is to look at what can be generated internally to achieve um, the housing objectives and, and these um, climate change goals. 
this is just a, a quick overview of my research design. Um, we're trying to find the relationship between user satisfaction and density and uh, embodied carbon. Um, so user satisfaction itself is primary data collecting that information. Um, embodied cap carbons um, data collection is going to be uh, a design of areas and secondary data from building materials, assessing what's there, and finding out a ratio of how to represent it on a sliding scale of low, medium, high um, carbon emissions. Um, the density is pre you know, pretty straightforward in that we just take measurements of the buildings, and the government itself has designated housing estates, so we're actually looking into the hazard estates to determine how to fashion our, our, our research study, because if you did, there's a lot of informal building, um, so to be able to get some form of um, interesting or accurate as near as possible data, we're working within uh, the government estates that have boundaries uh, and um, works better than in uh, an informal sector. And so in density, what are the methods? Well, we're basically measuring the buildings, the low density buildings and high density buildings. We're selecting an area um, and we're going to look at 60 houses in each estate, in the medium density estate and the uh, high density estate. And so we're going to have questionnaires um, well, just taking you know measurements of the existing building, what's existing, information, physical information we can get, and also information from what what government designated those areas to be. Naturally, they're really not um, what they were meant to be. I'm just going to go back very quickly. For example, that CIA high density area, uh, which is really you know right now there's a lot of flooding in Lagos because of climate change, well, they call it Nigeria, really. And we've always had that um, poor infrastructure because of the cost of leaving, because of the fact that um, government isn't quick enough. They, they, you know, they can't keep up with the rate of growth of, of the city itself. And so these are the two uh, case study areas, as a high density and that's uh, the low density. Right now, I didn't think it, it made sense for me to, to bring pictures of them submerged in water because that's what's that's the situation at the moment. Um, so back to um, this is a, a diagram of is from that source a density how they relate to people's behaviours their perceptions their needs the qu quantitative density calculations you can get that uh, and the quality of the physical and ambient environment in trying to establish. Uh, user satisfaction. Um, so user satisfaction is a topic that has been very well worked on in, in, fact, in terms of research. Uh, however, we're going to, this is going to be our primary data because we, we can, you know, reach out to the people, um, 120 house, households and with each data set. So we're going to get um, quite a bit of information from them. And I've based my um, research study on uh, this four various theories than um, Maslow's needs theory, the housing needs theory, which says as families grow, they you know they, they needs change. The housing deficit theory, theory where ha you know households are not physically um, satisfied with what they get, and the psychology construct theory that uh, which says that people as they progress in life, determine what's best for them or what they desire to have. So we've taken that into cognizance while we were um, designing the uh, um, questionnaires. And the, the questionnaires really are based on a combination of, or an adaptation of the English Housing Survey and the American Housing Survey. Um, Then I'm uh, looking at how do we uh, get um, data from the embodied carbon. I talked about very quickly uh, when I started up that um, because of the nature of building in Nigeria, a lot of the things are imported from you know China, India, lots of building materials. Uh, it's really difficult, um, 
and because of the energy problem, it's really difficult to uh, get um, accurate data in that regard of, so just a minute left here, so okay. Um, so I think I, I just had a, a, an idea, so we're gonna take po photos, we're going to uh, sort of transfer secondary data to get our primary data and determine a ratio. We're actually out doing the survey right now. And uh, that's my last slide. It's, it talks about, um, this is some of the review studies we've done and the relationships between user satisfaction and uh, the different variables, like housing attributes, substances, they correlate to user satisfaction. User, user satisfaction depends on determinants, the layout, lighting, environment, dwelling, services, ownership. User satisfaction correlates to retrofitting. Uh, the lowest carbon emissions world that really is, comes from that, we, you know, that part of the world, we don't really make, make so much uh, carbon. Um, but we have challenges with um, materials. Wood is really good and we have a lot of it, but people don't want to build wood buildings, they want to use concrete. So they need to be, oh, sorry, they need to be um, um, educated. And let's talk about, I just put, this is from some work I did earlier, uh, recommendations, what can be done um, to be able to uh, help with actualizing or sensitizing people to the things they need to do and government to be able to uh, get uh, better housing in line with, um, with carbon goals uh, at the moment. Yeah, yeah, you can carry on if you want, but okay. it's shorter time for questions. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, we've got time for a couple of questions. Yes. Uh, hey there, thank you for the presentation. So I just want to ask because I, have you found out any other external parameters other than the four that might influence that satisfaction and how have you isolated against them? Um, well, I think, yes, I have. Finance, really, and home ownership, which I think is um, it's quite a huge topic on its own. So I've just sort of limited myself to to those areas, but my, my, my main interest actually is housing, and without finance you can't, you know, do housing. So I know it, there's something called green finance, uh, and when I was talking about how carbon offsetting could be done by, um, I mean, apart, well, you know the theory of carbon offsetting, people that don't generate so much carbon, they could, someone who generates a lot could pay for the work they do in those regions. Um, so yes, finance has, because uh, a lot of the housing in that part of the world is supplied privately. Um, so, so the rules or the uh, regulations, guard, you know, guarding them, are different from what you do with government projects. Um, so that's, that's how that's how selected, just staying within some boundaries to be able to. Okay. Any other questions? Any question? I have one. Okay. Yep. Materials. You said that concrete is the main uh, material yes. used, and there was encouragement for people to use wood. Um, are there wood already used, or is it for the not future? really? What, or would it be locally sourced? The wood? Well, it would be locally sourced, but really, what has been used in some uh, sort of sporadically is um, um, clay, um, burnt clay, and I mean I know ad adobe is a very good material, but it's not really used in that part of. Nigeria. Um, you, you, you get it used in probably northern Nigeria and traditionally and it's very it's got amazing cooling properties it's, it's kind of, but somehow I think it's a part everybody wants to build you know what everybody else is doing as opposed to um, looking at what's best so I think things like this can generate um, those type of interest I've got a, a, just just a question on. I mean, you mentioned informal settlements. Yes. So, for your particular study, what kind of information, what kind of data, has been particularly difficult to get a hold of at scale because of the nature of those informal settlements? Because that's obviously not just an issue in Nigeria. You see in many other countries where you might have these kind of off-the-shelf models and assessments that assume certain data is available, but then applying it to an informal settlement where that those those buildings are not so well regulated or recorded or monitored. Yeah. 
So from your study, what, what kind of information is particularly difficult to get to get hold of? For example, what, what would be difficult is what the actual, uh, say the building walls actually admit. Because why they're not, a lot of them are not manufactured like locally. Mm. Even steel isn't, manu isn't manufactured locally. So that, that would be difficult. Um, so that's why we're doing that. But I, I, I think what we could do, use are ratios of, you know, the ratio of the areas to what the materials, what we're expecting. So it's really going to be an approximation of what it is. I hope I understood the question properly. Enough. Yes, yeah, it was, it's just the nature of informal settlements. Just yes. It's by, by their very nature very difficult to get any information about those informal settlements at scale that you can e extrapolate. But yeah, that under, understood. Okay, if there's uh, no more questions, thank you very much for Thanks. a really interesting presentation. Okay, so next up we have uh, Karina Astrid Bagirano. Apologies for mispronunci mispronunciations of, of any names. Uh, and she'll be talking about evaluating uh, the applicability of digital twin framework on procurement processes from her work at Edinburgh Napier University. Over to you. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so my name is Astrid. I'm a PhD student at Edinburgh Napier University and I'm researching digital twins and their applicability in procurement processes. I'm going to talk about my work so far, a bit about digital twins, their link with procurement, my literature review, a bit of my methodology and then future work, mainly for myself and conclusions. Um, so first of all, what are digital twins? Um, it all started with um, US Apollo program in early 2000, when we have uh, two spaceships, one being the actual face of the spaceship, the physical twin, and one being the, the, the uh, t reflection of that physical twin onto which the space conditions were replicated onto. That was upgraded with sensors and all those um, space conditions were providing predictive capabilities for the space that went on to, to the space machine. Um, that was quite successful, so a lot of other companies have followed suit. We have uh, General Electric, Chevron, Bentley, Maserati, um, DHL and quite a lot of cities as well that have bridged this technology to uh, look into smart cities. Um, so cities of Singapore, um, we have a few in the UK as well. We have a better version of a digital twin in York and Hull and um, other such cities. So what are digital twins? The concept refers to that cyber-physical integration of data. So we're having the, the physical asset and the twin, um, um, that's the reflection of that asset and all the data um, relationship in between the two. Um, literature looks at um, different levels of digital twin. We consider that there, there are three di levels of digital twin, with the th third one being the true digital twin, um, depending on the data variations in between them. So digital model being the most basic one, level one digital twin if you want, and then digital, tw digital twin being uh, the, the true one. Uh, with the middle one, the digital shadow being the one that we most currently have when people refer to them actually having a digital twin. Uh, the built environment has seen an unprecedented drive for digitalization. We have had the UK government recently published in favor of a digital twin mandate. Uh, we have had the call for a golden thread of building information, um, which uh, was um, a, a request for digitalization to support net zero practices. And then that's when the digital twin was um, um, not, not firstly mentioned, but, but um, definitely supported by, officially by the UK government. Uh, what do they do? Um, so as I said, they bridge towards smart cities. Um, that is one of their, their biggest um, uses and they often, uh, they're often applied to large scale um, um, uh, uses as such. Um, in the last 20 years, uh, they were mostly used in operational phases of a project. Um, so mostly towards the, the end of a project and, and my, my, my research focuses on the earlier stages, but I'm, I'm gonna make the, the difference between the two. And literature as well uh, looks most into manufacturing and aviation. Those are the, 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 the industries that are by far um, the most digital to inverse, if you want, and um, the built environment is only following suit um, from there. So this is a uh, digital twin on various project stages based on the river plan of works, if, if you're familiar with that. I'm an architect from profession, so this is something that um, I look at quite, quite regularly. But looking at first stages, basically, that's pre-construction stages normally, and also pre-procurement stages. Um, so digital twin can help with defining and developing designs, assessing that performance of a proposal or of a bid. It can support complex decision making. Uh, it, we can have real time scenarios, um, testing what if scenarios, forecasting scenarios as well. Um, we can have earlier data integration with IoT, data analytics and other digital twins, which is the, the intention of the, the, the UK government in creating this national grid of digital twins that are all connected. 
and also support um, systems like design for manufacture, offsite manufacturing, modern methods of construction, but basically by, 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 by de-risking the appeal of, of more innovative um, of, of, um, technologies and, 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 and proposals in a project at that early stage. Uh, stage five and six, that usually refers, uh, refers to construction handover stages. Uh, here, Digital Twin can look at the risk assessment prevention. Basically, the twin is a twin of a construction site at this moment in time. Uh, we could have effective project execution. We can assess as-built scenarios versus as-design scenarios and, and, and get data from that. We can do reality capture. That's usually done with uh, sensors and drones and that sort of thing on site. We can have remote and immersive operation. Of course, all of this, all of this uh, um, uh, project stages will entail um, cost and, and, and time um, savings if, if um, applied properly. And uh, yeah, provides that certainty throughout the life cycle of, of that uh, project due to that data capture. And that happens, you know, for example, future claims, um, having that data from uh, early on on site. And then operational stage, that is the most common stage used for digital twin. Um, that would be use stage, so stage six or seven in the RIBA uh, plan of stage, provides actionable insight, increases the control over that asset that the building operator or the um, um, maintenance uh, team have, reduces unpredictable downtime errors, assesses uh, malfunctions, it could schedule repairs. If we're talking about the level three of the digital twin, if you remember my diagram earlier, it could actually act on those repairs. So the twin, the live twin, would look at that data and act based on that, you know, the artificial intelligence components of it is thought to act on those particular repairs, which are to be expected, or maintenance work, et cetera, et cetera. And then lastly, uh, lesson learned. This is beyond the review plan uh, of works, but lesson learned is, is basically when we're looking at beyond the use of a building. Um, so that's probably the main difference between the digital twin and BIM. Uh, BIM uses, uh, ends at the, the end of a project, and that is it. We do not need that, that archive of data anymore. The digital twin moves on and doesn't quite have an end date. So we're archiving that data in order to provide that lesson learned opportunity for future generations to look at the way we have built that asset and the way we build in general. And um, yeah, uh, as I said, uh, we're having that output feedback back into the organization. We're teaching AI to respond better for, for future such requests. And for a level three, for a true digital twin, if you want, uh, we're completing that with self-governments and total oversight over the asset. Um, very quickly on procurement opportunities. This is a drier part of my, of my PhD, but um, I, I do believe this is important and particularly important uh, following the, the conversation we had from the Scottish government um, key speaker um, this morning when we looked at looking at the problem from a complex, complex side and how we integrate all of these things together um, and when we're looking at things like uh, tackling net zero. So digital twin literature uh, picked around the same time uh, as the government amended the Climate Change Act, which we now know at net zero. Uh, procurement mindful of net zero grew substantially. The competitive manner of traditional procuring system is not quite fit for um, first developing, uh, d delivering net zero, but also for adopting all those digital twin principles. Um, that is an overlapping opportunity for digital twins to act as that golden thread of integrating all of this good design practicing, net zero considerations, and collaboration and transparency in procurement in order to, to produce and, and deliver on net zero um, targets. Collaborative procurement are superior to traditional procurement in this sense, and I'm um, um, focusing on my case studies on specific type of procurement systems that are collaborative and specific type of contracting that comes with it that will um, make sure that the digital twinning principles are integrated from the earlier stages of the project and not towards the last. Um, so, so in simple terms, that means that we are uh, appointing a contracting team earlier on into the project, and they are all working together with an offsite manufacturer, the FMA, in order to deliver uh, onto those uh, principles. A bit of my literature review. Um, as I said, despite the recognized benefits of Digital Twin, the, the defining um, uh, research is still in its early years, specifically in the built environment. So at the moment, we're still extracting value from, from aviation and manufacturing, but we don't have quite enough research specifically made for the built environment. Um, I've had a conversation with, with someone that's not here just earlier on, being like, so what exactly is Digital Twin? What's the definition? We do not have a definition that is widely recognized, let's say, within the industry and literature. So that's a barrier. Um, however, in the last year alone, we have had almost half of all the recorded publications on Digital Twins. So this movement, um, you know, just, just um, 
uh, definitely um, caught some speed in the in the last year alone. And um, um, yeah, I mean, I've you know sort of like thought I finished my literature review, and then you know I just had like the largest chunk of, of recorded publications in the past year. So it's always a, a reviewing process that will probably happen until at the end, the end of my my research. Um, here's a Venn diagram on the left on the relationship between digital twin publications and uh, procurement publications with the distinction made for, for collaborative procurement, which is specifically why I'm focusing my, my validation stage, um, if you want. And then that's where they interact with, with net zero. So yeah, despite despite being quite a few publications, especially on the procurement side, um, uh, there's still not, not that link between the net zero and digital twin uh, yet made. Uh, let, all right, OK. Uh, Literature, I'm focusing on developing a framework for this digital twin to um, uh, go into the earlier stages step by step and, and apply those digital twin principles um, with the collaborative procurement framework for a various um, um, construction projects. Methodology, I am currently at stage two, about to finish my semi-structured interviews with industry leaders in order to, to um, sort of like come up with that the, the digital twin definition to recognize the benefits of the digital twin for procurement and how can we best um, identify the, the um, how can we best support net zero um, utilizing digital twin um, principles. Um, so yeah, uh, future work uh, focuses on, on developing this, this uh, framework now uh, based on the literature review identified and the um, outcome of the semi-structured interviews. And in conclusion, I found this very nice quote uh, from Dr. Timia Nocta. Um, they said, digital twins represent an enormous opportunity for government to move towards data-driven and evidence-based climate change mitigations. And I would like to demystify this buzzword of digital twin and, and help make this, uh, this uh, development, of, through to the development of this framework, uh, a, a reality. Thank you. Any questions? I, I have one while people are thinking maybe um, so you really helpfully defined digital twin at the beginning because it does seem that it's used in, in, in a whole range of different ways in academia and, and industry um, a study using a model is sometimes described as a digital twin so do, 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 you, do you feel that there's a, a bit of an, a narrowing if you kind of come across a bit of a narrowing over time that people now they're using the term properly or are, do you, are we still all over the place with how we how we call yeah, uh, I mean, it is in, in many senses like BIM, you know, when, when that kind of started about and, and you know, we had like a, an, an industry questionnaire and everyone was like, oh, we're all using BIM, but no one was actually using BIM or not to, to, to the capabilities they were claiming to be using BIM. So, so digital twin in, in, in some regards is the same. And that's why I feel like this research and in quite a lot of research that, you know, um, I think there's, there's at least one more digital twin research tonight here are, are looking into making sure that that is established now rather than trying to turn that into a trend in which people just jump on because that's expected of them, especially in the in, in, in construction industry where these technological trends don't come from us, but to us, you know, from, from the outside. Um, and then, yeah, make, make sure that that's actually understood and that those benefits are, are understood and they're are, are sought after for what they are rather than just, just to say, you know, we're all using digital twins, which is the risk here. And, and do you think it would be actually valued? Is it valued by industry uh, by that definition or will it always be seen as a bit, uh, or might it be seen as a, a bit of a quirk, a bit of a, a sort of, of a badge? Will it, do you think it will be meaningfully valued as, as we move on? I definitely do. I actually think it would be quite hard without it, um, especially the way we're, we're moving in towards you know, the smart cities and you know, this kind of like mega structures. And, and, and even though UK is not expanding the same way that the city of Singapore is expanding, the way we're looking at services, the way we're looking at procuring, the way we're looking at logistics and supply chain, that needs to modernize and to come to a point that's supporting our, our collective uh, well, well, use of these services, and, and especially when we're looking at you know decarbonisation, that's absolutely necessary. That the way we're we're doing these things changes drastically, and net zero, uh, digital twins are a fantastic opportunity that we should definitely leverage on. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, uh, might be a bit of devil's advocate here, uh, <laughs> but I genuinely want to ask: Is there, uh, like, from your like uh, findings so far, what is the benefit? Because that's a very computationally heavy aspect, and at the moment we're still trying to use thermostats <laughs> yeah. in most buildings. So, yeah, what have you found? Have you found so far the benefit to be to actually make these changes in the kind of digital space and see the outputs? Yeah. So, so uh, no, thanks for that. That's 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 a good question. And um, the answer, the, the simple answer, is that digital twin can do everything. 
which doesn't quite help, right? Because you know, when 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 you're even if you're pitching that to a company, right? If you know, I'm obviously in the architect sphere, so you're looking at a company and you're like, so you should get the children. Why? Well, it just does anything. That's not quite answering or solving a problem. So we do need to focus down on a particular problem that we want to solve and then utilize digital twin to solve that problem or the capabilities of this twin to solve that problem. At the core, we have data and data is very powerful. In construction, we have all these fragmented stages and that's why I kind of looked at the Rebo plan of works, but every sort of like fragmentation of the construction process and, and by the construction, I don't actually mean construction on site. I mean, from brief development up until, you know, use and beyond. All of those moments are, are almost done in complete isolation. You know, we have architects working on their own and uh, engineers working on their own, and it's very hard to car uh, capture carbon at those earlier stages of the project. We have almost no idea what's happening there. Um, and, 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 and there's a lot of inefficiencies that happen at the earlier stage of a project. We have several value engineering uh, opportunities that are like just done because co contractors are not brought on, 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 on the team earlier on. You know, so once we have a method that we can actually capture all of that valuable data from, from the earlier stages of the project, well, we can actually know what's happening and where is that inefficiency coming from and how we can you know, move forward with that. In simpler terms, what digital twins can do now, as in tomorrow, well, we can have a digital twin of a of built asset. Uh, we can use it for retrofitting. We can find out, you know, how, how that that um, asset is used. Um, usually, when we're looking at you know um, building performance um, and energy uh, loss, we're having some assumptions that are made when that building is being built. But in reality, we're having very different data. Um, so, a digital twin could measure that and make sure that over time we are we understand that the way our buildings perform. So that's probably the, the most sort of like basic way that we can use. And, and digital twins are used today for that in buildings. How we can leverage it to, to be more useful and to, to sort of like help generations to come understand the sort of like legacy of, of poorly performed buildings that we're leaving them. That's that's probably the, the bigger question. Yeah. That's great. Okay, I think that's that's a really really quick one. Yeah. 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 Are you planning to use uh, a smart city software in your research, or you will only focus on, on the methodology and the process? Um, yeah, also a quick answer. Uh, no, I'm not planning to use a smart city software. I'm, I'm actually looking at the earlier contracting, procuring, installing, you know, those principles of digital twinning, therefore, uh, to, to develop this framework. So, you know, if someone was to take this framework and apply it on a large, uh, you know, smart city scale, then that would be great. You know, if someone wants to apply it on a, like, building development of 200 blocks, then that's also great. But the, the, the intention is that that is there to demystify digital twin and make sure that the next applications are, are following some type of structure. Okay. Thank you. We, okay. we have a smart city capability at the National Decommissioning Center, so maybe this is a possible collaboration. We should definitely talk. <laughs> great. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really interesting talk. So our next speaker is also from Edinburgh Napier, so Antoine Regis, uh, who also contributes to the steering group of uh, this energy, energy efficiency and buildings theme. And he's going to be talking about connecting Scottish public buildings to low temperature heat. Antoine, over to you. Yeah, thank you. OK, so I'm approaching the final stage of my PhD. and. To go back to the beginning, why I did look at that because decarbonization of heat is quite of the uh, the elephant in the room. I would say um, it's quite important. And when we look at what's happening just now in the UK, so we rely a lot on gas, and by 2050 we have to move away from gas, and we are going to rely on heat pumps and mm, and uh, low carbon heat networks, which are called also fourth generation heat network or fifth generation. And they are both efficient at a reduced temperature. And the question is there, um, our systems have been designed for years to operate at 80 degree flow and 70 return. And with, if we take the, the definition of the fourth generation district heating, they have to operate at 55 and the return at 25, 30. So the question is, can we connect or do we have to do some uh, level of retrofit or is it not possible? And that was the start. If we look at a typical flow temperature um, based on uh, the test reference year for Edinburgh, we can already see that we could connect existing buildings because we rarely approach the outdoor design temperature, which is most of the time it's minus five, and most of the season it's uh, zero degree, five degree, 10 degrees. And if we look at the future, uh, forecast for 2020 and 50 and 80, that will um, 
be even more possible. So we can drop the temperature even just now. That's a, a, a quick um, look at the um, heating degree days for the bot botanic garden in Edinburgh. And we can see that we are, uh, we, you, we are using less and less heat to heat our buildings. Uh, we could question also, yes, we are losing less heat, but extreme events could uh, push us to still design our system for extreme temperature. I know um, extreme events are less likely to happen in the future, and they are less happy. They, ha they are not happening uh, just now as they were in the past. So the PhD is, can we connect our buildings? And the driver for that is, um, can we provide some tools for the asset manager or uh, urban development planners to see, is your building ready? If it is not ready, what do you have to retrofit? Is it just radiators or the envelope? Because if you spread the cost of this retrofit, you can save a lot. If you just arrive when your distributing is arriving in your street and you say, oh, that's where I have to uh, retrofit my building, that will be, it will come at a high cost. So um, a long term vision is good. And it's also, it could also provide some support for what the government would like to develop is we want the buildings to be low temperature ready. So could we work on the sort of certification to say, okay, this building is low temperature ready, then that's in the bag, I would say, and then we can move forward. Well, the methodology was uh, to look at what's happening elsewhere, maybe De Denmark, Sweden, uh, focus on the Scottish public buildings because public buildings will be the first to connect Look at the performance gap, because the three key criteria we have to look at is the performance gap of the building, oversizing of the heating system, and the operation of the system. Are we going to continue to do night setback, or do we have to move towards continuous heating, heating at night? So literature review show that in uh, Denmark, they consider that their building stock has a sort of nas nascent readiness. And now they are focusing on tracking faults within their system, but they consider that bu their building stock is ready to connect to low temperature. So can we export those uh, conclusions to the UK? The first thing, there's not that much publication for UK buildings. Um, what is good is the oversizing of the heating system in the UK is likely to be quite significant, which is good. The downside is the UK buildings usually perform quite poorly compared to other buildings in Denmark and Sweden. First, because it's the oldest building stock in, in Europe and probably in the world. And there is a quite a significant performance gap also. Uh, here we are using night setback when we have to move towards continuous heating, so that's a limitation. And the policies also are different in Sweden. They have limited their flow temperature in the 80s where it's going to happen, but just now in Scotland and, and in the UK. So if we look at public buildings, so they, they will be the first to connect, so that's a way to de-risk the problem, the, the, um, any district heating um, project. Uh, when we talk about public building, we talk about schools, because uh, two thirds of the stock is, uh, is, is uh, with schools. So I looked at the energy use intensity of gas, um, that's uh, from the EPC. So, we, uh, and all buildings, so we looked at 300 buildings from the Ed city of Edinburgh Council. Um, and it, so from 1979, the U value were introduced in the building regulations. And from there, we can see that there was quite a spike in the uh, expected energy use. And from there, it has reduced. And before the introduction of the U values, um, so, all buildings pre-1919, which is uh, the biggest uh, part of this stock, um, they are not performing that bad. But that's the calculated EPC. If we compare, if we go, if we look at the true energy use, so we had access to all the energy use for the whole building stock, we can see that up the average is around 180. What is so it's fairly. Since the 1975 uh, introduction of the building regulation and the maximum U value, energy use has decreased. The most recent one is going up, but this this one there's not a lot of um, buildings in this um, age group, so it's maybe not representative. Um, so and the same, all buildings are not using that much energy if you compare to most recent ones. And if we compare the two, we have so both. Um, 
EPC and through energy use. And if we, oh, do we have some? Yeah, we should have that. So we have a performance gap which is increasing across the age groups. Um, and if we apply that performance gap to the flow temperature you could apply in your heating systems, you can see that the most recent ones are eventually less likely to use low temperature heat. And the older ones are still able to use it because the performance gap is more reduced. One of the limitations here is we assume that radiators are oversized by 10%, and it's very likely that they are oversized by much more than that. So that's the next stage of the research I will present probably next year. Um, so it's a quite a cautious, uh, cautious approach. So the takeaway message would be that existing buildings in Scotland are, can already use low temperature heat most of the year. Uh, we need more investigation to understand why the recent buildings have this performance gap. It could be because uh, a brand new building, a school, could be used over the weekend uh, by local community and that's not captured in the EPC. And then, so we measure a performance gap that doesn't really exist. So we need to go a little bit more into the details. It's very, very important to uh, cap the flow temperature to 55 degrees and that's uh, I think going to happen. And it would be probably interesting for planning to develop a low temperature ready certificate. And that's me. Thank you. Okay, any questions for Antoine? I'll chip it. Oh, yeah, one, yeah. yeah. Um, hi Antoine, good presentation. In terms of the deployment of heat pumps in Scotland, do you think it's um, more appropriate to deploy heat networks um, rather than millions of people? District. Uh, I think it will. District. The, yeah, yeah, it, it will really depend on the location. And if we take city centres, Glasgow, Edinburgh, I don't see how you could really deploy heat pumps because that would be a restriction. Where do you put your condenser at the back of the... So uh, uh, district heating is probably a good solution. It's where do you harvest the heat? Do you have also access to um, waste heat? Where is the incinerator on the whole south of Edinburgh is also a good source of heat. So that's very uh, ideal for, for district heating. So it's really... Um, the heat density is probably one of the criteria. If it's um, countryside, heat pump is probably the way to move forward because the district heating would be far too expensive. But an old city like Edinburgh or Glasgow, as soon as you start to make a trench and put some pipes, I think there's also quite a lot of problems. Uh, but and the cost, cost, cost would be higher. So. Any other questions? Yep. Hey, Antoine, just a quick one. Uh, if we have hot water, we need to have at least 60 or 62 to not have issues with your genella or other issues. Yep. Is uh, like hot water consumption prevalent in public buildings or is that not an aspect? Yeah, so the focus here is on the heating and the space heating. That means the when, uh, when you have your heat exchanger, you still have heat coming at probably 65. Um, and then if your space heating can draw only 45 from that, you will have a return which is 35 and that will help the efficiency of your distributing scheme. But still, you still have, well, you need to have access to 65 to pasteurize your hot water, unless you have a, a booster or something, and then, well, why not, with electric booster. Yep. Two questions. Uh, could you go back to the sure. gap? I uh, was so, uh, confusing about what uh, the gap it is. Yes. Can you elaborate this? Uh, you mentioned the performance gap, so what's the gap it is? The yes, performance gap. The performance gap is between what is expected for a building to use and what we are measuring. So the energy consumption or it's in a, it's gas use. Oh okay. Gas use. But the second is why the low temperature is better in your presentation. Like uh, sorry, uh, why the low temperature heat heater is better? Like um if I understand well, if you have a high performance gap that means you need to supply more heat and probably raise the temperature. I don't know if it's 
Yes, or why it is better? Why we are doing oh, okay, sorry. Um, so what, what we have now is uh, we are burning gas to have 80 degree flow in your radiators, so quite hot. If we want to use heat pumps, uh, a, a heat pump is very efficient if the water is below 55 degrees. So when it's very cold outside and your heat pump uh, is delivering you 55 degrees when it has been designed to deliver 80 degrees, are you warm enough? Are we able to heat our buildings if we limit the flow temperature? Okay. If we limit the flow temperature, we know that our systems behind, so the heat pumps and the circuiting are much more efficient, but maybe it would be cold or we can't reach 20 degrees, we can reach only 18 or 17. So that's why the future is about uh, reducing the temperature in the systems. We have to stop um, burning. Uh, just a, qu a quick one for me. You, you, you mentioned the p the possibility of having a kind of low temperature readiness indicator that you could have with a with with, with a dwelling to see if it's it's ready for a low temperature system. Yeah. Have you have you come across um, some of the next generation energy performance certificate research that's happening at the moment across Europe? Because there's the latest iteration of the energy performance in buildings directive, which kind of drives changes to EPCs. And one of the big parts of that at the moment is actually looking at new metrics new outputs that could be attached to an EPC, one of which actually is a smart red, smart readiness indicator, mm -hmm. um, and that's been tested at, at the moment, and it, it seems there's pretty quite strong parallels between how that's being proposed compared to what your low temperature readiness indicator might be. So I'm just wondering whether you're aware of that at the moment, because there's a big cluster of European yeah. projects working on new uh, metrics no, no, for new, new EPCs. In fact, the, the low temperature ready certificate is an ID that started to navigate in the last four weeks with Dave Pearson from uh, Star Renewable okay. um, and I thought that could be a, a postdoc but yes it has to be linked with something that uh, an EPC or an extension of the EPC is probably the right, the right way forward but I, I didn't have a lot of yeah no that's why it's, just, I mean, it's, it's quite an interesting time for, for EPCs at the moment because they've been pushed and pulled lots of different directions so I was, yeah it's just came to mind when I, when I saw Yeah, it. if it's not through the EBC, it's, um, I don't know if a council could make it mandatory to just to plan how is the development of the city. Um, or the one who would be very interested would be um, distributing companies to see, can we connect or are we ha do we have to wait 10 more years that this building, this building is going to be retrofitted or yeah, yeah. and de-risk the projects. Yeah. Thanks very much, Antoine, for that, again, interesting <laughs> presentation. And final speaker for this particular session uh, is Androniki Papathanasi. Uh, final apologies in case I mispronounced uh, his no, surname. Right. <laughs> from Edinburgh University. Um, and this work is going to be on an interdisciplinary energy analysis modeling towards decarbonizing Scotland's building sector in a virtual multi-vector energy plant model. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to my talk. Um, first of all, thank, thank, let me thank you for coming here today. Uh, my name is Andronik Papathanasi, and um, I'm a first year PhD student. And this afternoon, I'm going to take a look at fuel poverty and energy efficiency in buildings. Fuel poverty is a complex interaction between households with low income and low energy efficiency. It occurs when people are unable to heat their home to adequate standards at a reasonable cost. In the UK, researchers have extensively investigated the field of fuel poverty, while a significant number of different policies proves a strong level of political interest. Despite this, fuel poverty is still a growing societal challenge that puts the welfare of many people at risk. Now, let's have a look at uh, what is the situation in Scotland. In Scotland, in 2019, almost a quarter of the population was living in fuel poverty, while approximately 13% of the Scottish households were in extreme fuel poverty, as stated in the Scottish House condition survey. 
In the same year, the Scottish government set a target of no more than 5% of Scottish households to be in fuel poverty by 2040. Most importantly, we should consider the fact that this was the situation back in 2019. Today, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the current war in Ukraine, much of the world is facing shortages in oil, gas, and electricity. As a result, energy prices have rocketed, leading to an unprecedented energy crisis that is likely to significantly affect domestic energy consumption. So, inevitably, we're expecting that many more households have already crossed the fuel poverty thresholds. So, we need for research, the need for research to understand how people use energy in their home and why they may change their habits and energy use patterns have, has never been greater. At the same time, in 2019, direct greenhouse gases emissions from buildings accounting for 17% of UK greenhouse gases emissions being mainly the result of burning fossil fuels for heating. According to the latest heat policy statement launched by the Scottish government in 2015, heating currently accounts for over 55% of the nation's energy use and 47% of its carbon emissions. So we understand that improving the energy performance of buildings and decarbonizing the heat supply are essential drivers to ensure success of Scotland's progress towards net zero. Also, this confirms the urgency to shift away from the combustion of fossil fuels towards renewable energy generation to meet energy demands. Given these facts, this research focuses on how we can improve the energy performance of buildings and how we can decarbonize the heat supply in a sustainable and cost-effective manner. Decarbonizing the building sector also requires end users to change their behavior, which will then change energy consumption patterns. Because of that, this, this study strives to realize which modeling approach most appropriately incorporates energy-related behavioral uncertainties? Of building occupants, how the public can be encouraged to realize the full potential of novel energy efficiency technologies, and to what extent the Scottish government should facilitate this. Additionally, New sustainability-related key performance indicators will be integrated in the scenario modeling to secure modeling alignment with wider policy objectives, and more specifically, those determined by the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Principally, this research seeks to incorporate sociopolitical issues to expand our modeling pra practices beyond traditional engineering through interdisciplinary research collaboration and more efficient thinking. So my problem is fuel poverty. And as an engineer, I want to tackle this phenomenon. And the question is how? Energy inefficient buildings are very closely related to fuel poor households. Given this fact and the previously mentioned challenges, this research aims to examine domestic energy consumption patterns, as well as to explore socio-technical, sustainable, low-carbon energy solutions to decarbonize Scotland's building sector and eradicate fuel poverty by 2045. To accomplish its targets, this study carries out an interdisciplinary energy analysis and modeling towards decarbonizing Scotland's building sector in a virtual multi-vector energy plan model. The study will explore synergies, interoperabilities, and integration potential of different renewables-based virtual multi-vector energy plan models 
to realize and meet the energy demand, as well as to enhance the energy efficiency in residential buildings in Scotland, and particularly in deprived areas. A multi-objective optimization model will take into consideration data types and require inputs for an energy poverty vulnerability index to realize to what changes and buildings upgrades we should proceed with in order to reduce energy consumption and so to reduce the energy bills. Then it will move forward with a technology that brings the highest consumer surplus and minimizes the cost of energy. Occupant behavior is one of the major factors influencing building energy consumption and contributing to uncertainty in building energy use prediction and simulation. So it's necessary to further look into building occupant behaviors as an adjustable parameter when generating different building design scenarios. To simulate the direct and indirect impacts of stochastic behavioral actions, efforts are needed to develop probabilistic models for capturing the variability of energy-related occupant behaviors. Ultimately, the study will proceed with a, set of with a set of policy strategies on the actor's behavior for the implementation of the transition towards the decarbonization of the building sector in Scotland. Thank you. And any questions? Yes, at the back. Um, yes. <laughs> So um, the initial plan is to proceed with um, retrofit, like uh, upgrades like f to the building, and uh, then we will look also into which technologies will be most appropriate to like, achieve our goals. And this um, like project is part of a wider, bigger project. It's called Dispatch. And um, we are like a big team that they, we like collaborate and um, we just like work with each other and at some point when the time will come for the technology then I will have a talk with my colleagues who like look into heat pumps or the further like systems like energy systems and see what happens. But first thing is building upgrades, yeah. Yes, uh, I have two questions. Could you go back? Uh, Here? Yes. Okay. How have, uh, when and why did you develop this model? That, that, I think that this will be very, very tricky. But um, as I said earlier, um, so like the data sets and um, yeah, the data that I will need to use, um, it will be the major challenge. But people from my team, they work on like energy consumption patterns and um, I will actually get the data from people and I do hope that I will manage to build this yeah probabilistic model but I, I know that is like the most tricky part of my project you know like modeling behaviors like agents yeah I know that hopefully we'll yeah, see in the future it's like when it's not like literature they, they use historical data to, uh, to establish such kind of model using different regression or a modeling technique so uh, but that's uh, so I want to know more so yeah so just yeah. because I started my research like six months ago and I'm still going through the literature, I'm trying to find like the best approaches and what the models are so I can choose like later uh, what model I will use it or if I will build it from scratch or, or what I'm gonna do. I just, yeah, I just need more time to answer, you know, work so actually to answer this question, yeah. Maybe your information is the next 66 is willing to do this uh, for the model IEA project. IEA. Yeah. Uh, the okay. second question actually for, yeah. the, for the post of the energy bill. Uh, so you will consider, yeah, this one. Here. So you will consider the price of the like energy cost because the price of like electricity is different uh, day by day or time by time. Like, so you will also consider, consider the historic data of the energy cost. 
if I will consider data of the energy cost. Yeah, uh, for example, like for the electricity, yeah. like the, in the morning or at night, the price is different. So if you want to reduce the bill, yeah. will you consider the variation of the price? Yes, I think so. Oh, well, okay. I mean, it's part of the reality. So we should follow, I mean, since we do have this data, I will try to integrate them in my models. So, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. I suppose I have a slight follow-up question on on that on the first question there that is, is whether your intention is to have a probabilistic model on behaviour that can actually pick up disruptive events like the current cost of living and energy crisis, or whether you're looking at a probabilistic model that can just capture a, a kind of a point in time across across a population. So, would you be hoping to be able to um, quantify the impact of disruptive events like? Like Ukraine and, and the spike of energy prices, is that and, and how that affects behaviour is that is that the intention? I know you said you're very early so, stages. Yeah, it's very so. At, at this stage, I'm thinking that if we manage to like um, derive some data from uh, like uh, from energy consumption at home, like in like several homes, then we will like put them in our models and we will try to understand how people. Um, like uh, react when they have reacted and um, according to the current situation and I will always be focusing on like fuel poverty so I will try to integrate in my model like a definition well, it's country in the UK has a different definition for fuel poverty so I will try it's time to check if a household is fuel poor or not and that has to do with like their income like it depends on like how they define yeah in each situation um like fuel poverty and then um oh so if i have I, I could compare like the past before the pandemic and the war with now then it will be very, very beneficial to see how people have changed their behavior like yeah and patterns so we can tell what effect, like how the pandemic has affected mm. like yeah. the households somehow. It's, it's difficult, there's been so much change in the last three years, it's very difficult to get a baseline to, to but it's, yeah, it's a bit Yes, big, I know it's challenge. like very ambitious and I would like to do as much as possible. Three years is not enough, but mm. we'll see. <laughs> I think every, we every have a very good team that we work very like closely okay. and collaborate very well. So I do hope that we will manage to do Excellent stuff. I, I think every PhD student in the history of PhDs has said three and a half years is not enough for, for a PhD. It's not. <laughs> okay, yeah. that's, that's, thank you so much. Thank, thank you very, you very much. much.